Well, good evening, everybody. Um, so it's again, it's Laura, the Public Programs Coordinator for the First Division Museum at Cantini Park. And I want to welcome everybody to our October Date with History. Uh, can you guys believe it's October already? Wow. Um, before we get started in tonight's presentation, I just want to remind everybody one last time that tonight's presentation utilizes closed captioning. And that closed captioning is auto generated through Zoom, which means it's about 80% accurate most of the time. Um, it has a hard time with places and names. So buckle up um, those auto generated closed captions because tonight's going to be a fun one. Um, so if you'd like to turn those off, you're more than welcome to. You can turn them off by using the uh, live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and selecting hide subtitles. Um, if you'd like to utilize them tonight, but you'd like to adjust how big or how small they can be, um, you can do that by using the subtitle settings. But let's get started because I have so much to tell everybody about before we get started this evening. So first and foremost, I want to let everybody know about an exciting new program. Um, now, this program is being hosted by our sister museum here at Cantini Park, which is the Robert R. McCormick House. So the McCormick House is starting a brand new virtual lecture series that is premiering this Saturday. Um, and it's perfect timing because this weekend, of course, is the 150th anniversary of the Great Chicago Fire. So their premier presentation is going to be all about the Great Chicago Fire and particularly the Chicago Tribune and its reporting. And I'm really looking forward to being a guest to that presentation and learning more about some of the history in my own backyard. Um, so if you'd like to sign up for that, you can register at cantini.org, just like Date with History. It is a free presentation uh, virtually through Zoom. So you can register for that online. And again, that is this weekend, Saturday, October 9th at 7 p.m., which is the actual 150th anniversary of the Great Chicago Fire. So we hope you'll be able to join us for that presentation. I know I'm looking forward to it. But let's talk about our next date with history. Our next date, virtual date with history is going to be Thursday, November 4th at 7 p.m. online via Zoom, just like this one. And it's going to be um, with historian Patrick O'Donnell. And Patrick O'Donnell is going to share with us one of his new books, um, The Unknowns, The Untold Story of America's Unknown Soldier and World War I's Most Decorated Heroes Who Brought Him Home. So we're going to be staying on this World War I train for next month as well. And, um, particularly just a really lovely book. So if you haven't had a chance to read that one, make sure you go out and get it before our next presentation with uh, historian Patrick O'Donnell. And again, you can register for that at cantini.org or fdmuseum.org. There'll be a link to that one on both of them. So those are our upcoming virtual offerings here at the museum. So let me pull down my screen for you. Excellent. All right, everybody, I want to um, like everybody else welcome our speaker this evening. Uh, I know I'm personally really excited to learn more about J.R.R. Tolkien and his experiences in World War One and the experience of his sons in World War Two and how that really impacted his writing. So everybody join me in a big welcome to tonight's presenter, Miss Janet Brennan Croft. She is a librarian at the University of Northern Iowa. She is the author of War in the Works of J.R.R. Tolkien, and she has also written and is the editor and co-editor of many collections of literary essays, the most recent one being Something Has Gone Crack, New Perspectives on Tolkien and in the Great War. She is also a uh, Pardon me, she also edits the scholarly journal Myth Lore. And Janet, I am welcome to our date with history. One more thing before we get started, everybody, I just want to remind everyone that should you have questions to, for tonight's presentation, you can do so um, by using the QA button at the bottom of your screen. That's how you're going to get questions to me. We're going to answer questions at the end of the presentation this evening. And I also want to say a big hello and thank you and welcome to our Illinois State teachers who are joining us this evening. I know a lot of you are history teachers and for the first time we have some English teachers joining us this evening as well as we don't often uh, delve into the literary history aspect. We're pretty excited. All right, Janet, the floor is yours and thank you so much. All right, well, thank you very much and welcome everybody. I think we are going to have an excited, exciting time with the closed captioning with Tolkien's names. Uh, we'll see how it, if it can handle any of them. Um, I did see we had one person phoning in. 
I'll assure you that the slides I'm going to show are not essential uh, to enjoying this presentation. They're mainly um, illustrations and historical photos. Um, and I see, I, I was looking at uh, who's attending. I saw at least half a dozen familiar names. So yay, good to see everybody. Um, I am going to share my screen here and get this thing started. All right, let's do this slideshow. All right, um, I'm hoping everybody sees this. Uh, Laura, can you tell me if it's working right? We are not seeing your screen. Not seeing my screen. All right, let me close this back down and give it another try. All right, let's see. Should have worked. There we go. Ah, great, wonderful. Okay, all right. Um, it started as a slideshow and there we go. All right, okay. All right, uh, well, thank you for that introduction. And um, let's see, I am, um, I want to tell you um, one thing that the at the journal Mythlore is available online for free in its entirety. The newest issue should be coming up within two weeks. So um, there the uh, on my bibliography at the end, or somewhere back at the very end in the last couple of slides, you'll see a link that can take you there if you're interested in looking at that. So um, tonight I'm going to talk about Tolkien's experiences as a soldier in World War I and as a father of two sons who served in World War II, as Laura said. If you have seen the 2019 film Tolkien, you notice that the chronology of events that I described is a little bit different. Uh, the film, which I'll talk about more later, took more than a few liberties with the timeline, though it gets the spirit and the feel of Tolkien's experiences mostly right. So, in J.R.R. Tolkien's vast body of work, the Great War serves as a source of imagery, motifs, and examples of military operations and strategy, of central themes about conflict, comradeship, duty, and the destruction of the environment, and of personal trauma, which he worked out in meaningful symbolic form throughout his life. Particular motifs appear over and over again, the effects of war on individuals, families, and society whether or war can ever be justified, and if so, the proper conduct of war, close friendships among groups of men, the glory and horror of battle. The depiction of war and its effects were drawn from his own life. He served in the First World War at the Battle of the Somme, and two of his sons fought in the Second World War. Like all artists, he absorbed the materials of his own life into his art. While he was at King Edward's school as a young man, Tolkien was exposed to the ideals and concepts of military service through his involvement with the officer's training corps, as were many young men in his age group and social class. There, he learned the basics of drill and camp, participated in war games, learned to shoot and care for his weapon, and began picking up semaphore and Morse code. He attended the nationwide OTC encampments in 1909 and 1910, and was chosen for the contingent of eight cadets from King Edward's school that attended the 1911 coronation and royal progress of George V. He joined King Edward's horse a few months later, shortly after starting his first year at Oxford in November of 1911. Uh, King Edward's horse was a colonial regiment open to those like Tolkien who were born in one of Great Britain's colonies. And he spent a year with them learning some rudiments of cavalry training. This long-term familiarity with military life under canvas, even though not under actual field conditions, lends an easy verisimilitude to his depictions of life on the open road in military encampments in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. In August 1914, everything changed. World War I turned the world upside down. Most of the young men that Tolkien knew at Oxford enlisted right away. His own brother, Hillary, had already enlisted as a bugler when Ronald returned to Oxford for the fall term. Against family and social expectations that he too should enlist immediately, Tolkien instead joined a program that let him finish his BA while he was taking officer training. The 2019 film Tolkien suspends the audience in anxious anticipation of the moment when the war will impact the three main concerns of the young man's life, the direction his Oxford study should take, his romantic relationship with Edith Bratt, and his deep friendship with his schoolmates in the Tea Club and Barovian Society and their desires to become artists and writers who would change the world. While, as I mentioned, the film does take many liberties, 
It is accurate in depicting how the young men felt pulled in different directions by these sometimes competing concerns and how the war impacted his imagination, building on his existing predilection for fantasy, fairy tales, and the long view of history. When Tolkien completed his degree in 1915, he was assigned to the Lancashire Fusiliers as a second lieutenant. He spent the rest of the year in officer training camps, and in early 1916, he de decided to specialize in signaling, which had some connection to the language interest that he already had. Tolkien touches on his training experiences in several of his letters, writing to his fiance Edith from Oxford in October and November of 1914, he mentions marching in the rain and spending ages cleaning his rifle afterwards. In July 1915, he began officer training with the Lancashire Fusiliers and learned to drill recruits. And then later he attended lectures on what he called the dull backwaters of the art of killing and wrote about bomb throwing practice with dummies and dealing with drill in extremes of heat and cold. Tolkien's specialized training and signaling included Morse code, flag and disc signaling, the transmission of messages by heliograph and lamp, the use of signal rockets and field telephones, and even how to handle carrier pigeons. Map making seems to have been one of the skills Tolkien most enjoyed learning, judging by the many maps of Middle Earth on which he lavished so much time and effort. Military life didn't really agree with Tolkien, or maybe it's the other way around, he didn't agree with it. He didn't like the ragtime music that many of his fellow officers enjoyed playing on their gramophones, and he found the meals inedible and the conditions uncomfortable. As Tolkien admitted in a 1944 letter to his son Christopher, I was not a good officer. He said he spent a great deal of time working on his elvish languages and histories at meals, during lectures, and even reportedly in dugouts while under fire, although that was most likely an exaggeration. Ronald and Edith knew that it was only a matter of time before he was sent to the front and that it was quite possible he might never come back. So they got married in March of 1916. Three months later, his embarkation orders arrived and his battalion was sent to France. So this is one place where the Tolkien film really differs pretty radically from the actual course of events. To make matters even more miserable, at some time during the journey to France, all of Tolkien's kit was lost. His carefully selected camp bed, sleeping bag, mattress, spare boots, washstand, everything. It all had to be replaced by begging, borrowing, and buying. An incident that's amusingly echoed in his writing many years later when Bilbo sets out from Bag End without even a pocket handkerchief. After three weeks, Ronald's battalion was sent to the front, marching to the Somme in the pouring rain at the end of June. His company was held in reserve behind the lines at Buzancourt while A Company was sent to the trenches on July 6th. On July 14th, two weeks after the commencement of the Battle of the Somme, his company marched to the front to relieve their companions. Tolkien survived a number of engagements, finding that the neat worldly conditions under which he trained had little in common with signaling in the field. Signaling officers were not expected to participate in much hand-to-hand -hand combat, since their job was to keep communications working at all costs. However, it was not by any means a safe job. One soldier's biography tells of seeing a signaler ordered to call for reinforcements. As soon as he raised his flags, he was cut down by enemy fire. In any case, there was no avoiding what Tolkien called the animal horror of the trenches, the dead bodies in the mud and the craters filled with water and rats. As his later friend C.S. Lewis described in his own uh, World War I experiences, the horribly smashed men still moving like half crushed beetles and the landscape of sheer earth without a blade of grass. Ronald was fortunate enough to escape serious injury, but two of his closest friends from King Edward's school, Rob Gilson and Jeffrey Bash Smith, died in battle or as a result of illness or injuries. As Tolkien said in the introduction to the second edition of The Lord of the Rings, it seems now often forgotten that to be caught by youth in 1914 was no less hideous an experience than to be involved in 1939 and the following years. By 1918, all but one of my close friends were dead. On October 27, 1916, Tolkien came down with trench fever and was shipped back to England. Tolkien spent the rest of the war convalescing in various infirmaries and training camps in England, becoming almost well and then succumbing to fever again until he was finally declared fit for duty just before the war ended in November 1918. During this time, Ronald and Edith's first son, John, was born. 
they eventually had three sons and one daughter. The war had a powerful effect on Tolkien's imagination, and it was during this period of illness and convalescence that Tolkien started writing the stories that provided a background for his imaginary languages. Tolkien's close friend and fellow fantasy author, author C.S. Lewis, whom I mentioned earlier, had a similar experience of the Great War. He too had been a student at Oxford and was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Somerset Light Infantry. He was a year behind Tolkien, arriving at the frontline trenches at Eros on the eve of his 19th birthday in 1917. Like Tolkien, Lewis lost most of his close friends in the war, including Patty Moore, whose mother he later supported for the rest of her life. Unlike Tolkien, however, he was seriously wounded by shellfire. Some of Lewis's earliest published writings are war, war poems, and the chapter Guns in Good Company in his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, covers his war experiences. C.S. Lewis wrote in his review of The Lord of the Rings that Tolkien's war has the very quality of the war my generation knew. It is all here, the endless unintelligible movement, the sinister quiet of the front when everything is now ready, the flying civilians, the lively vivid friendships, the background of something like despair and the merry foreground, and such heaven sent windfalls as a cache of choice tobacco salvaged from a ruin. Tolkien, on the other hand, wrote little directly about the war, although he did explicitly acknowledge his debt to his war experiences in several places. He once commented, my Sam Gamgee is indeed a reflection of the English soldier, of the privates and batmen that I knew in the 1914 war and recognized as so far superior to myself. In a 1960 letter, Tolkien wrote, the dead marshes and the Moranin owe something to Northern France after the Battle of the Somme. The dead faces floating just below the surface of the water were a standard image in great war memoirs and fiction. And in On Fairy Stories, his essay on, on uh, fantasy and fairy story writing, Tolkien says, a taste for fairy stories was wakened by philology on the threshold of manhood and quickened to full life by war. It shows that he was already thinking in terms of expressing himself through the means of the fairy tale. Tolkien was predisposed to fit his war experiences into this framework from the start, rather than into the realistic and ironic form that many other writers like Siegfried Sassoon or Robert Graves used. Tolkien came out of the war with a profound sense of respect for the courage of the ordinary soldier and a deep understanding of the effects of the stress of war on the human soul. Tolkien's short play, The Homecoming of Bjortnoth Bjorthelm's Son, is important for understanding the development of his ideas on courage and military leadership. Published in 1953, but written in 1945 or earlier, it is a dramatic verse play expanding on an episode from the Anglo-Saxon poem, The Battle of Malden. In it, two men, the young son of a bard and an old farmer, debate the courage and deeds of Bjortnoth, whose dead body they seek at night on the battlefield where he fell. You can see the terrain in the bottom right picture here. Bjortnoth allowed the Viking invaders to come across the causeway he was pledged to defend, just so the battle would be a mightier matter for song. Tolkien sees far more honor in the conduct of Bjortnoth's men than their leader. Their part was to endure and die and not to question. It is the heroism of obedience and love, not of pride or willfulness, that is the most moving. <clears throat> War made its presence known in some way in almost every work by Tolkien. Tolkien's first prose writing after his experiences on the battlefields of Northern France, the fall of Gondolin, is full of extended and terrifying scenes of battle. Some elements of the fall of Gondolin seem to echo World War I. For example, the enemy uses hollow metallic monsters carrying orcs inside, which sounds very much like the tanks that first took the field at the Psalm in September of 1916, while Tolkien was still on active duty. Or even intruded into the charmingly illustrated Father Christmas letters that Tolkien wrote to his children every year from 1920 through 1943, perhaps not unexpectedly, as the children must have been concerned about the news of the world. I am so glad you did not forget to write to me again this year. The number of children who keep up with me seems to be getting smaller. I expect it is because of this horrible war. At present, so terribly many people have lost their homes or have left them. Half the world seems to be in the wrong place. The last letter written in 1943 to Priscilla comments that my messengers tell me that people call it grim this year. I think they mean miserable, and so it is, I fear, in very many places where I was especially fond of going. 
Tolkien wrote much of the Lord of the Rings during World War II, but insisted that little or nothing in it was modified by the war that began in 1939 or its sequels. The real war does not resemble the legendary war in its process or its conclusion. However, there are some themes throughout the work that reflect his perspective as a veteran of an earlier war, and there are plot elements that reveal the attention he paid to world events as he wrote. As he admits later in the foreword, an author, an author cannot remain wholly unaffected by his experience. Tolkien's perspective as a veteran gave him an outlook on World War II not shared by most of the young men and women then enlisting. We can see some of his insights on the retrospective futility of World War I in a speech by Elrond, who remembers the last great battle with Sauron and the years between the wars. Sauron was diminished, but not destroyed. His ring was lost, but not unmade. The Dark Tower was broken, but its foundations were not removed. In Frodo's plaintive words, I wish it need not have happened in my time, is an echo of Tolkien's own feeling of darkening horizons. There is one aspect of the Lord of the Rings that sets it apart from Tolkien's pre-war writing and shows the influence of World War II in a somewhat unexpected way. During this war, Tolkien was not just a veteran and an active participant in homeland defense efforts, but also the parent of two combatants. Michael became an anti-aircraft gunner and saw active duty defending aerodromes in Britain and France. Christopher joined the Royal Air Force and was sent to South Africa to train as a fighter pilot. Tolkien's eldest son, John, though not in the armed forces, was training for the priesthood in Rome and had to be evacuated from Italy shortly before the war broke out. All this gave Tolkien an additional perspective on war to explore in his writing. It is not World War II itself, but the new and personal experience of being an anxious parent of grown children in active military service that gives his writing on war an added poignancy. Losing a parent was sadly familiar to the orphan Tolkien, but the possibility of losing a child was something frighteningly new and different. In fact, one letter to Christopher, in one letter to Christopher, he very pointedly comments that too many of the leaders of the war are childless and view the war from a safe vantage point in their large motor cars. All of his letters to Christopher and Michael are full of a tender concern for their physical and spiritual safety and a longing to be able to share their danger. In the pre-World War II Hobbit, there are no actual parent-child pairs when you think about it. There was no global war going on during its writing, and the thought of his own children ever serving in the military was probably not uppermost in Tolkien's mind. The Shire is a peaceful country, and war is part of the distant past. Swords in these parts are mostly blunt, and axes are used for trees, and shields as cradles or dish covers, as he says in The Hobbit. Children never seem to die before their parents. However, there are many parent-child pairs in The Lord of the Rings, and Tolkien explores a variety of parental reactions to the risks their children run in war. <clears throat> Consciously or not, Tolkien may have been examining all the ramifications of his possible reactions to what could happen to Michael or Christopher, and what might have happened to Priscilla if she could have served in combat, or to John if he hadn't left Rome in time. <clears throat> One of the grimmest lessons the Lord of the Rings teaches about, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> <clears throat> one of the grimmest lessons that the Lord of the Rings teaches about war is that some of the mental wounds it causes never heal in this world. Frodo is Tolkien's prime example of the potential heartbreaking effects of war on the mind. What Tolkien showed Frodo going through after his return to Hobbiton bears a strong resemblance to post-traumatic stress order, disorder. During World War I, military doctors suddenly began to notice a large number of cases of men suffering from war stress, which they called shell shock. Many of its symptoms sound like the effect of the black breath of the Nazgul, or like Frodo's sufferings after the attack with the Morgul blade on Weathertop. Many of these doctors first thought shell shock was a failure of manly courage. Some of them grew to have a more sympathetic outlook after experiencing conditions at the front themselves. The very definition of courage was revised by the war and the phenomenon of shell shock, from physical heroism to stoical endurance. And this is why Tolkien chose to show us both traditional heroism in battle on the one hand through characters like Aragorn and Faramir, but made it clear that what Frodo and Sam were doing and enduring was so much more significant. 
This may help to explain why Frodo is the only character who exhibits such a strong delayed reaction to his experiences. Frodo's experience of the war was different from everyone else's and more akin to modern war and its unrelieved stress. After entering Mordor, he was in effect threatened continually by an invisible enemy for 10, 10 days and nights without relief. And in fact, his sense of being under the constant observation of an unseen enemy dates back to the moment he put the ring on on Amon Hen. All the other characters experience a more traditional pattern of war with battles lasting a day and a night at most and divided in space and time from other confrontations. Frodo chose to kept, keep his pain hidden, writing about his experiences in the Red Book that he leaves to Sam, but not talking to anyone directly about what he went through. What Frodo says in the end, as he leaves the middle, middle Earth to find rest and healing in the Elven lands is, I tried to save the Shire and it has been saved, but not for me. It must often be so when things are in danger, someone has to give them up so that others may keep them. Tolkien's fiction, criticism, and letters make it clear that he greatly desired peace, but on the other hand, felt that war was sometimes necessary despite his disgust with modern military means. Tolkien was not a pacifist in the political sense, that is in the sense of using pacifism as a moral tool to affect nonviolent political change. And he did not appear to agree with pacifists that their philosophy would ensure peace. Tom Bombadil lives a life of pure pacifism, but his existence might at any time depend entirely on the efforts of those willing to defend him. Frodo's rejection of the use of violence during the scouring of the Shire is shown to be admirable, but impractical as the success of Mary and Pippin's methods demonstrate. Eowyn, the shield maiden's response to the pacifistic philosophy of the warden of the houses of healing is bitterly hopeless and realistic. It needs but one foe to breed a war, not two, Master Warden, and those who have not swords can still die upon them. But it is also clear that Tolkien did not see war as a splendid thing in and of itself. While Tolkien regarded war as something which on occasion was unavoidable, he did not glorify war as such. Although there are glorious moments during the Battle of Pelennor Fields, they are more than balanced by other passages on the evils of war. He was certainly well aware of the shortcomings of modern warfare in particular, and of the dangers of too much pride in military valor. Eowyn herself, newly hopeful a few pages later, vows to no longer take joy only in the songs of slaying, but become a healer instead. The whole subject of whether or not the allies can use the ring against Sauron is a major issue that demonstrates Tolkien's thinking on the just conduct of war. Even the strongest and most moral person who tried to use the ring would find that they were not strong enough to refrain from the temptation to unjustly enslave the rest of the world. Aragorn and Faramir, for example, see the moral dangers of using the ring very clearly from the start and refuse to take it. Those who desire peace above all else are tempted by the ring's power to allow them to impose their will on the world for good purpose. But the wise like Gandalf and Galadriel and even Sam see the trap of power for what it is. Only those who can remove themselves entirely from wanting to influence the outside world like Tom Pombadil in his private little land are completely unaffected by the ring. Tolkien warns us against the concentration of power and the will to dominate. Sauron, Saruman, and the ring itself illustrate a soul-destroying addiction to the power of controlling others. In his writing about war, Tolkien also reminds us of the eucatastrophic nature of mercy, the good catastrophe is a term that, that Tolkien invented, that transcending the hard rules of war and freely offering mercy and pity to an enemy is an act of grace that may be rebound in unexpected ways and turn the tide of events. Tolkien stated in one of his letters that if he was like any character in the books, it was Faramir. In the woods of Athelion, Faramir says to Frodo, war must be while we defend our lives against a destroyer who would devour us all. But I do not love the bright sword for its sharpness, nor the arrow for its swiftness, nor the warrior for his glory. I love only that which they defend. Tolkien, through his stories and characters, gives us ways to think about the purpose of war, its just conduct, its horrors, and the opportunities it can provide to prove one's courage and moral mettle in service to that which one loves. Thank you.
And then I've got a couple of slides uh, with bibliography here. And if uh, I think if Laura is sharing the slides later, you'll be able to get these and follow up with more reading if you want to. Absolutely. If anybody is interested in those, I'm happy to, um, Janet will go ahead and share those slides with me and I'm happy to share any of those if you'd like to learn more about the topic. I do mm -hmm. want to, I do actually have some questions to start off with you with. So if you'd like to um, go ahead, Janet, and pull your screen down. Yes, let's see if we can get this off of here. Stop we'll get here. started on Q&A. All right. Excellent. So um, I have some questions that had come in prior to the presentation. Um, so we're just going to get started with that one. It's one that you, actually you and I talked about before the presentation, which ah. is, I think, a very basic question. But if you're not a huge like Tolkien fan or you just like really enjoy the Lord of the Rings, this is a great question. What is the correct pronunciation of the author's <laughs> last name? It's a great question. I have seen recently that he pronounced it himself Tolkien. Okay. Um, in in the United States, you usually hear Tolkien, and it's very hard to get out of that habit when you've been saying that way all your life. Absolutely. Uh, Tolkien is probably more correct. My dad pronounced it Tolkien. Shout out to my dad who's watching, who read me The Lord of the Rings <laughs> growing up. But we pronounced it Tolkien, and um, yeah, and when you watch the film, it's uh, they say Tolkien, so it's been on. I know it's been on a lot of people's minds. Yeah. Um, another question that came in was actually about C.S. Lewis. Uh -huh. um, and the question is, uh, we saw, we learned a little bit about um, Tolkien's uh, views post World War One and how that infected his views on the upcoming World War Two. Do we have any insight if uh, C.S. Lewis shared those same kind of sentiments or if his experiences in World War One impacted how he viewed World War Two? Yeah, um, not quite as much work has been done on Lewis and World War I. I've got um, this book here, this uh, Baptism of Fire, um, has a couple of chapters on Lewis, and there's a book, um, A Morning After War. Um, Lewis was very good at compartmentalizing. So he put his war experiences in a box and pretty much tried to not maybe pretend they didn't happen, but um, not really dwell on them the way they way the way the way they kind of seem to settle in the back of Tolkien's mind and come back to life when he was working on Lord of the Rings. Mm. So yeah, you don't see as much work on Lewis and the war. And um, there is some though. I mean, we've got some. Uh, there's a very interesting essay in that in this book that I just showed you on how he depicts war in the Nor Narnia books, which are for children. So the war is a bit sanitized. Um, you'll notice that after a battle, you never really see what happens to the bodies. They just kind of disappear. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So we had um, mentioned a little bit about how Frodo um, represents uh, the soldiers who are suffering from PTSD or as they would call it, shell shock at the time. Um, and we also know, hear a lot about other World War I veterans who are processing those emotions through the arts, um, be it painting, literature, et cetera, um, music. Do we feel a little bit like Tolkien maybe was demonstrating some of those types of feelings and behaviors and used his writing as an outlet? Oh yes, I, I very much feel that's the truth. Um, I, I, I go into that a lot more in my, my first book up here, The uh, War in the Works of Tolkien, uh, when I compare him to some of the other authors who came out of the war. Uh, there was quite a, a movement of um, uh, this, this feeling of irony, you know, deep irony. Um, and, but there were some of the authors also went and kind of verged on fantasy and Tolkien took that further than others. Now, the classic source on this is The Great War in Modern Memory by Paul Fussell. And he does talk about people like Siegfried Sassoon and Robert Graves and all these others who had this experience and came out and wrote these memoirs that were sometimes deeply, savagely ironic. But with some of these authors, you do see a turn towards the fantastic, a turn towards mythologizing their experiences. And I think that's what we see with Tolkien. And there's another group of authors, um, uh, Tom Shippey is one of the top scholars on Tolkien, and he talks about traumatized authors, authors who have been through World War I, World War II, and then turned to the fantastic. Um, you know, Tolkien, Lewis, George Orwell, there were a number of them who um, you might look at their work and say, that's fantasy, that's science fiction. This is where it comes from, ways to process this experience and turn it into something artistically meaningful. Hmm. So we know that Lewis, um, Tolkien is writing 
before World War One for sure. But um, when do we start to see like Middle Earth start to kind of come into his mind and start writing about it? Did that happen not until after World War One? He starts writing closer to World War Two or even before World War One. Do we start to see Middle Earth kind of coming to his mind? We don't really see Middle Earth. Earth yet. Now, the, the person who does the most on that period of his writing is John Garth, um, and uh, his book came out almost the same time as mine did. Um, uh, at, in his early days, as a as a student in you know in what we would call high school in this country, um, he wrote poetry. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the the group that I mentioned of his friends, the the Tea Club and Barovian Society, they were all going to be poets and artists and everything, and and change the world. Um, So his poetry was, it was um, fantastic in a way, you know, he had elves and so on and so forth, but he didn't really start developing these legends until that period in convalescence in the hospitals when he, after he came down with trench fever, he'd done a little bit, he had some imagery, he was uh, building imagery around Edith and around uh, cities where, where they had lived or where they had significant experiences but it didn't really start coalescing into his, what we call his legendarium until he was laid up with trench fever and started filling these notebooks with stuff. That's really interesting. Do you have, um, do you think that Tolkien's views on war and pacifism were at any way influenced also by his Catholic beliefs? Yes, very much so. Um, I think um, there's, the, the, the philosophical framework called just war theory is something mm-hmm. that he probably would have encountered and I look at how he writes about war uh, again in that that this one. <laughs> I look at how he writes about war and how it fits in with this whole philosophy of just war, which is a whole framework for how war can be conducted, should be conducted, when it should be conducted, when it is uh, morally defensible to engage in war. Um, so I, I think the wars that he depicts, the people he depicts on the good side of his wars are following this just war theory, this just war philosophy. Yeah. And while we're kind of like on that on that same frame, one of our guests was saying that uh, in their opinion, they always took uh, Frodo's hesitation to kill and Gandalf and company's willingness to spare Wormtongue and Saruman um, as being very like an imitation of like being Christ-like. Um, do you think that plays within the same type of mindset? I think it really does. I think it really does. Um, there's... Um, there's a lot in Tolkien about mercy and, and what, what he can do. And then I mentioned the term eucatastrophe and all those yeah. who are not coming to this from knowing Tolkien well, um, won't be familiar with that term. It appears in his essay on fairy stories. And that's what he uses for the joyful turn in fairy stories, the joyful turn in any story. When everything looks black, it looks like everything's going to be horrible. And then suddenly you know, Gandalf comes over the hill with cavalry or something like that. And everything becomes, um, it, it becomes possible to continue on with life, let's say. And a lot of that is tied in with these acts of mercy. You get that eucatastrophe of, and it's a, it's a very kind of sad and horrible one, but of Gollum biting off Frodo's finger and taking the ring and falling into, and that is all because of these acts of mercy that had been demonstrated towards Gollum over the course of the story. Did any of Tolkien's children write, um, and does he have any living descendants? Um, let me see, yes. Uh, Christopher, his, his second son, was the one who carried on his own work. Now, Christopher passed away um, last year, year before, not very long ago, but he continued his father's work by collecting all of his papers, writing this, 12 volume thing called the history of middle earth uh doing all taking all of these notes and putting to, together in volumes it's an amazing service to the scholar you, you're not going to see this much with with modern writers who write on a computer and their earlier drafts get erased and thrown away mm-hmm. so we have this amazing richness of resources wow. um his other children uh, michael john priscilla did not uh, write or carry that on, but there is a grandchild, Simon, who has written some mystery novels. I think there are some others too. Um, they're the ones I know um, most of all. Uh, oh, and, and Bailey Tolkien, a granddaughter, I believe, is the one who has been working with the Father Christmas letters and putting them together. 
it would be interesting, as you had mentioned, that Christopher served in World War II, and if there were any influences in his writing from his experience as well. I don't think so, because most of what we see from most of what we saw from Christopher was really um, correlating and making sense of his father's work rather than his own um, original. Now he had done he did some translations, uh, things like that, um, the scholarly works, not not any fiction. Mm. Yeah. All right. Do you think Tolkien's war experience um, shaped how he wrote his different characters and creatures in Lord of the Rings? And maybe give us like two or three really good examples of where you really feel his war experience influenced mm. this specific character. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, let's see. Well, one thing that I notice a lot in his work is that bad leaders lead from behind. That is something, uh, there's the, what they call the Chateau Generals in World War I, uh, way behind the lines, not sharing their men's experiences at the front, not understanding what conditions were like, maybe issuing orders without knowing what the latest intelligence was. So you see that with Tolkien, you see these bad leaders like Saruman sends all his troops off to, to uh, attack Helm's Deep, he stays there in the Orthanc. Um, even on the good side, the ones who are problematic, like Denethor, Denethor, the leader of uh, you know, Minas Tirith, he stays there sending out his sons with their troops to face danger. Um, so your, your good leaders, though, like Aragorn and Faramir, they're right out there with them. Um, and that's part of the, you know, the rehabilitation of Theoden, who has been under this influence of worm tongue, and he's all decrepit and crouched on his throne and everything. Part of how Tolkien is showing his rehabilitation is that he starts, he leads his people to the front again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So while we're kind of on this train of thought, I'm gonna ask you this question. I think this is a really interesting question too. Um, do you think it is more correct to think of Tolkien's characters, good or bad, as allegorical for real people or groups of people as he experienced them in war? Or do you think it is more correct to see his characters as representative of his personal views and as a vehicle for his mythology? Really interesting question. Yeah, yeah. A Tolkien um, famously disliked allegory and he insisted that nothing was ever allegorical in his work. There were, there were some things where there are definitely allegories, but I don't think you could say that any of these characters were were somebody that was in his life now you've got sam who is the the batman character it, you know the, the 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 person who serves frodo who helps frodo who acts as a batman would have acted to an officer in world war one but he's not representing any one particular person uh even though the Tolkien film tried to make it out that he was he is representing a type, a sort of a uh, conglomeration of these characters. And I think that's one of Tolkien's brilliances is that these characters can be a type, a, a you know, this is a warrior king type, but they're also people because they've got, they're not just fulfilling this, this symbolic role or anything. They are also people with characters of their own. Right. Yeah. I have a lot of guests who are coming in and commenting about Bailey, Christopher's wife, um, and just shouting out from the rooftops, yes, Bailey. Um, and some of our guests are pointing out things that she had written and translated and uh, oh. books, uh, the book of Lost Tales 1 and 2 translated into French. I didn't know that. That's interesting. I didn't know that. So, well, I'm going to have to look into her more. <laughs> I know. Next presentation, next presentation. I, I feel like I've been neglectful of her. <laughs> yeah, they're coming in with the Bailey information. It sounds really interesting. Thank cool. you for sharing that with us. I'll try and get those out as I see them coming up on my screen. Um, yeah. Do you think Tolkien followed the hero's journey form of storytelling? Um, okay, yes. Um, Joseph Campbell's Heroes, Hero with a Thousand Faces did not come out till later, but it's, well, it's such a, it's such a trope that it's very hard to avoid. They're there was a fair amount of scholarship, um, mostly early on in Tolkien scholarship saying, oh, here's how exactly how it fits the hero's journey. Um, in fact, today I just got in the mail, Marina Tatar's, the, the um, but it's a heroid with a thousand and one faces. So mm -hmm. we've got our, our answer to uh, Campbell from a great female scholar of fairy tales. But anyway, to get back to the, the hero's journey, 
it's such an archetype that almost anything of this sort could be made to fit into it. It is though, there is that, um, that uh, call to adventure, that leaving home, that going out and having adventure, that coming back with a boon, that coming back changed. And it's such a, it, it's, it's hard to think of stories that don't fit that in some way, that can't be made to fit that. Um, but in fact, I also, um, I'm reminded in, my, in that first book, I was looking at the structure of trench warfare where you have this period in, you know, behind the lines, then you go up and then you come back for a period of rest, and then you go up again. And it's that same sort of separation and return, separation and return sort of uh, structure. Mm. Yeah. Can you touch a little bit more on uh, the benefits of Tolkien using uh, mythology or fantastical writing style as opposed to a realistic um, and ironic tones that are often used by wartime authors. Um, has this allowed him to express the impact of war in a really unique way? I think what it has done is made it more universal. Hmm. Um, you're not looking at this and saying this was an experience at this place and time and the further I get away from it the less I understand. You know that you know if you read something that's uh, very ironic and realistic and uh, like the further you get away from it you have to you have to go back and say now what does he mean by an entrenching tool what does he mean by a mess kit this doesn't make any sense to me uh, without having that knowledge but with something like this where it's universalized into the language of fairy tales and folk tales that we all sort of know at a at a at a very deep level that makes it universal, so we can all relate to those experiences. Now, I'm not as familiar with this next question, so you may have to provide a little more insight. Um, I have one guest who is wondering uh, what you what you thought or how you felt about the uh, "There's a Hole in My Bucket" by Roy Tolkien, his grandson. And I'm not familiar yeah. with that, so you can tell. I, us I'm not either. I don't know that one, so I can't I can't say anything about it. I, I do I do know that I do know um, Roy. I, I know um, that he is also a person also one of the Tolkien descendants who was writing. And um, and I think he's done some World War I stuff and I haven't read it, but yeah. I'll have to look into that one for sure. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that yeah. with us, giving us more research to do. I always love that. Yeah, this is making me uh, think we really need a good uh, source on all of Tolkien's descendants yeah, and what they've been they're writing. They're all apparently very literary talented. Yeah. So um, I have some roundup questions to um, as we start to kind of wind down the evening, and I think that they're both really um, excellent ones. So let's get started with some of them. Um, can you, um, sorry, my brain flipped out there for a second reading this. Um, how influential has Tolkien been, um, his legacy? Like, why is Tolkien famous? Oh, goodness. Well, it was kind of... Um... There, there's, there's this sort of perfect storm that brought him to everybody's attention. Um, you know, his books, they appeared in England, they got good reviews and everything, but what kind of really made it take, take off was the pirate paperback editions in the United States. And uh, those became suddenly very widely available just at the time when you started getting this, the hippie movement kind of going on. Uh, there was this, this yearning for this kind of stuff for fantasy, for deep meaning, that kind of thing. And these, these cheap pirated paperbacks filled that, but then because of it, because of this piracy and copyright situation, it blew up into a news story. So everybody knew about it. Um, so that's, that kind of made it all take off. And then everybody knew about it. And you see, you know, uh, Gandalf for president and, and you know, written up in graffiti and so on. But the thing is that they have lasting value, you know, it, it may have had this kind of, you know, kind of funny beginning, but the more you read it, the more you realize there is lasting value in this. Um, it, because of Tolkien, because of this success, you have this blossoming of fantasy writing. I mean, so many people owe so much to, uh, to Tolkien. Um, in fact, uh, um, yeah, it's Terry Pratchett had this had this, this wonderful little analogy that Tolkien is like Mount Fuji in, in Japanese paintings. Even when you don't see it there, it's there. You're standing on it or it's in the clouds, but 
Tolkien is always there when you're looking at fantasy. Uh, whether somebody is imitating or trying to escape from, he's too big of a mountain. Um, but yeah, but this is like, this is why we have three volume fantasies <laughs> because, I'm <talking. laughs> because I'm talking. While we're on that, um, do you have any modern authors or works that um, were influenced by Tolkien that you would personally recommend? Uh, I am a big fan of, of Terry Pratchett and he goes in a different direction. Uh, he started out um, in his early books being very, um, they were satire. They were very much satire. And one of his things was, well, Tolkien didn't think about where these people got their food and stuff like that. So he would go into these kind of satirical things. But as Pratchett went on, he got deeper and deeper and more philosophical. And what really came through, one of the things I really love with Pratchett is this marriage of moral outrage and humor and, um, and absolute brilliant writing. Uh, so I would highly recommend Pratchett, but don't read the first two books you wrote first, save those for later. Save those uh, for start, later. start somewhere in the middle. There, there's a, there are charts out there for where to start with Pratchett. Uh, there are like 40 some books in the Discworld series. Wow. So yeah, you can, you can get a lot of reading that way. Um, but he's someone I really highly recommend as kind of an heir of Tolkien, but not an imitator of Tolkien. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think that Tolkien's Legendarium achieved the impact that the TCBS, that, that, that club aspired to create? I think, I think it did. I think it did. And it's, uh, it's like everybody in the world knows about the Lord of the Rings. Now, a lot of people know it mainly through Peter Jackson's movies. And I personally don't think Peter Jackson really got all of the heart of Tolkien's work across. Uh, reading it's always going to be better, but if the movies bring you to reading it, then yay. Um, but yeah, I think I think he I think he has um, I think he has fulfilled that 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 uh, what they wanted to do was was bring this kind of um, this way of thinking about things to the world. Um, this way of looking like Tolkien did, looking behind the war, looking behind uh, modernity, looking at the long, long view of history and saying, well, here's, here's what's important. Um, here's, here's what's real. Here's what should make you think. Here's what you should uh, care about. Yeah. And finally, I have one final question for you before we start to wrap, before we wrap up this evening. And um, mm -hmm. this might be a hard question for you. And I apologize if I'm asking you to choose between your beloved children. But uh, <laughs> what is your favorite work by Tolkien? Oh, goodness. Yes, yes. And, and, we're, and even worse, I'm a librarian. So, you know, it's, 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 <laughs> it's one of those things. Oh, my favorite of what kind of his works? Oh, goodness. Um, it's a toughie. That is really tough. Um, Lord of the Rings, I practically have memorized. You know, I edit a journal and when I get a paper with quotes from the Lord of the Rings, I can like open the book to exactly the right place and check the quote. Um, I read The Hobbit a lot because it's just delightful. Um, of the shorter works, it kind of depends what I'm looking for. Now, Farmer Giles of Ham is a delight. It's just, it's funny as can be. <laughs> It's full of linguistic jokes and, and just hilarious characters and um, illustrations by Pauline Baines. Um, she, you probably, you might've run across her. She, she's illustrated uh, the Narnia books and a number of other things, but oh my gosh, it's just, it's hilarious. It's laugh. rollicking. It's one of my favorites too. Is yes. I am like, yes. Yes, okay. but, but on the kind of on the other end of the scale is Leaf by Niggle and then even further, Smith of Wooten Major. Smith of Wooten Major is the last story that Tolkien wrote. He was, he was an old man. He was feeling his age. He was feeling like, I'm winding down. I've got this last thing in me, but it's, it, it's a very um, elusive sort of story. You try to figure out exactly what he means mm -hmm. and you don't quite get it, but it's beautiful and haunting and sometimes terrifying. And it's just, it's um, not a story you would read to every kid, mm. but the ones who will get it will get it and will love it and cherish it. 
I had a last minute swing in question to follow up this question. And uh -huh. so I, I promise that this is the last one for the evening, but it's a good follow up to the question we just <laughs> talked about, which is who is your favorite Tolkien question, Tolkien character? And why is it Gandalf? <laughs> why is it Gandalf? <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, let's so see. Now, if I wanted to, yeah, if I was going to grow up to be somebody in Middle Earth, yeah, it might be Gandalf. But I have a very soft spot for Faramir. And I can see why Eowyn uh, yeah, wound up with him. And I'm jealous of her for that because he is one <laughs> of the best characters in all of Tolkien. <laughs> all right, Janet, I want to thank you so much for joining us. And for all of our guests who are tuning in, you know, we often take a deep dive into. Um, battles and soldier stories and we we're going to keep doing that but I want to thank you for joining us for this really unique veteran perspective of the war experiences of J.R.R. Tolkien and how that influenced his writing as we kind of take a, a pivot to touch into literary history and um, British history which we don't often do either and so I just want to thank you guys so much for coming along with us and for Janet sharing your knowledge with us I know I'm really excited to go back and restart all of the books now and start <laughs> looking for all of these things in them. So again, thank you so much, everybody. Um, just as a reminder here at the museum, we have our special exhibit, 100 Objects in 100 Hours, commemorating the 30th anniversary of Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm. So make sure you stop by the museum's lobby to check out 100 of our Desert Storm items that are currently not usually not on display, but are on display through the end of the year. Um, also make sure you keep checking the events calendar because Veterans Day is coming up and we're putting all of those features on our events calendar right now. And be sure to see you at the next Date with History, um, the unknowns of Patrick O'Donnell. We're looking forward to sharing that story with you. Have a wonderful weekend, oh. Janet. Have a I see one weekend. last question that came in. Who? What is the Funko Pop figure behind me? That is, oh, okay. um, that's Janet from The Good Place. <laughs> of course she's uh, she's she's basically a librarian so i have to have her as a my funko pop picture <laughs> absolutely and again thank you to all of our teachers and our veterans that are tuning in thank you for your service and welcome home and we will see you all next month good night janet good night Thanks. everybody bye, bye.